In the 1960s, the U.S. Air Force had a helicopter in their crosshairs. Surprisingly, it did not belong to one of its opponents behind the Iron Curtain, but rather, the U.S. Army. The costly Cheyenne helicopter, built by the Army to support its troops, was seen as a potential drain on the Air Force's own projects. To counter this rotorcraft, the Air Force began drawing up the specifications for a new close support plane, known as the AX. It was an aircraft and mission the Air Force really didn't want. However, the team at the Pentagon behind the AX saw things differently. They saw supporting troops on the ground as one of the most important missions, and they set about to build what would become one of the Air Force's most lethal weapons. The AX was an offensive weapon built to destroy tanks, armored personnel carriers, and soldiers entrenched in foxholes or behind sandbags. The whole of the aircraft was to be designed around a massive gun capable of blowing away the competition. While designing the gun specs, defense analyst Pierre Spray looked for an inspiration from a most unusual source, a hero of Nazi Germany. Because I was adamant that we had to do this purely from the point of view of the effectiveness demanded by combat experience, I assigned everybody on the team to read a book called Stuka Pilot by Colonel Hans Ulrich Rudel because I had found nothing in the entire literature on close support that gave a more precise and more objective view of what close support is really about. Rudel flew an incredible two and a half thousand missions where he rained havoc on opposing armies, destroying an astonishing number of enemy vehicles, including 519 tanks. His tank busting aircraft of choice was a specially modified Stuka, armed with two 37mm cannons. Spray began a worldwide search for a caliber of bullet powerful enough to pierce Soviet tank armor, while not so large as to make it unwieldy for an aircraft to fire. He found the perfect bullet in the land of fine chocolate and watches, Switzerland. Munitions manufacturer Or Leitner produced a devastating 30 mm round, which penetrated with Swiss watch-like precision. Now that Spray had found his bullet, he had to figure out a way to fit a thousand rounds worth on the AX. The massive amount of ammo was housed in a drum three quarters the size of a Volkswagen. Of course, when we started sizing the weapon, see how big it was and huge ammunition stored, because we wanted enough ammunition for 20 repeated passes. See, that was part of the long loiter, long endurance. It's not just hanging around, you also have to hang around and be dangerous, have weapons. Carrying so much ammo in such a powerful weapon, the AX might be best described as a flying piece of artillery. Though the 30mm shells were potent and capable of penetrating the thick Soviet armor, they wouldn't necessarily stop a tank in its tracks. At that time, a new type of bullet was in development, which packed a depleted uranium punch. Depleted uranium has exactly the same properties as magnesium. When you hit with a high velocity, you actually light off the metal. The metal burns inextinguishably, just like magnesium does in a flare. This thing is so incendiary that if you just have grease, the normal grease that's in the, in, the, in the sump under the engine, you're very likely to light the tank on fire because there's burning fragments everywhere once you've penetrated. By 1970, Spray and his team had put together all the specifications for the Rayx aircraft into a concept formulation package. The tremendous amount of work they did paid off. The USAF, still eager to kill the Cheyenne helicopter, approved the plans, as did Secretary of Defense McNamara and Congress. The US Army with the Cheyenne and the USAF with the AX weren't the only ones fighting for a piece of the government spending pie. The Marines had a futuristic close support aircraft of their own, the AV-8 Harrier. Chuck Myers took part in an evaluation of the three designs. The group leader turned to me and said, 
Well, we need a plan. Who are we going to visit? Who are we going to talk to about this subject? And I said, well, I think we probably ought to start with the Marine Corps because they probably know more about the subject than anybody else. They have great, great interest in air support. I set up the meetings for them over at Marine Corps headquarters, and our little group went over there. Uh, and we spent a whole morning listening to Marine Corps expound on the subject. And of course, they were pushing this thing called a Harrier, which, if I could think of an airplane least appropriate for close air support, that would be it, because of its vulnerability to small arms fire. Myers soon realized the bomber generals in the USAF weren't the only ones who had antipathy for the close support mission. We all convened for lunch, and it broke up into dual groups. And I remember sitting at a round table having lunch with a Marine, a couple of Marines, and uh, one of them was a colonel. And I never forget the colonel saying, he thumped the chair, I said, boy, we we'll already wait to get our F-14s. And the other guys in my group looked at me like, they're F-14s. They were no more interested in close air support all they could think of was they were going to get the F-14 along with the Navy. Everybody wants to fly fighters. Nobody really wants to do this horseshit mission down there in the dirt. While Congress evaluated the aircraft available for the close support mission, Spray's paper airplanes were turned into prototypes. When it came to testing, Spray once again carved his own path. I had felt very strongly all along that the right way to do this was to get prototypes built, two or three prototypes by each company, and have a real firing sh shoot-off, a competition, a fly-off. The 8-9-A-10 were the two entries into the AX program, which was our first uh, foray into a fly-off. Uh, that was a different approach. The four aircraft, two from each company, were flown over a period of, of many months at Edwards Air Force Base. That had never been done in the Air Force before. They built lots of prototypes and people were very reminiscent and very nostalgic about how great it was when we built them. But they never flew against each other. They were kind of engineering models. They went to Edwards Air Force Base. The test pilots flew them, clocked how fast they flew, how long, how high, how fast, and then kind of on paper compared them to other airplanes. We didn't want that. We wanted a real competition where you went and did the mission as realistically as you could with two manufacturers fighting it out and the guy who did the mission best would win. Northrop and Fairchild Republic were given a little over a year to construct three prototypes each, two flying and one in pieces just for test fire experiments. The possibility of being struck by ground fire was a reality of the close support mission something not factored into the designs of most jets of the era, which made them vulnerable to attack. Spray challenged aircraft manufacturers Northrop and Fairchild to design planes which kept the volatile fuel supply and the hot burning engines as far away from each other as possible. While Northrop buried the engines next to the fuselage, Fairchild came up with their own innovative solution. Fairchild came up with a superb solution. They have the engines out on pylons away from the fuselage. Uh, there's, no f there's no fuel between the engines. All the fuel is way forward in the wings, and it's brought a lot of pilots home. There would have been in airplanes that were burning and crashing. Spray once again rattled the establishment, this time with his choice of test pilots. We had the shoot-off. At Edwards Air Force Base, half the pilots were test pilots. This was another huge battle. Half of them were fighter pilots, real pilots, you know, which was crucial because we were going to do so much bombing and strafing. That's not something the test pilots, you know, are particularly adept at. Uh, so that was another revolution, another bureaucratic mess. Because, of course, the test pilot community has their own little sacred cows. So these two airplanes were flown first by company pilots, and then turned over to a team from the Air Force to go through a whole procedure in flight and in other logistics analyses, the whole world of flights. 
It was an extremely close competition between Northrop's A9 and Fairchild's A10. It was hard to choose a winner before counting up all the bullet holes and tallying up the scores on each test. I had thought that Northrop was going to win because they had so much slicker design, a little better aerodynamics. And lo and behold, after all the shooting was done and all the testing, Fairchild had taken the survivability a little more seriously, had an edge there, had a slight edge on some of the accuracy, dive bombing accuracy stuff, and they were awarded the contract. Um, it's exactly what's supposed to happen. The guy you didn't think was going to win won because he did a little better. It was pretty close to us. He was a really tight place. Yeah. We wouldn't have been badly served by either airplane. The A-10 Thunderbolt II was named after another legendary close support aircraft, the P-47 Thunderbolt. The A-10 was an excellent design, but Fairchild still had to work out some serious technical issues. We were doing all the follow-on tests on the A-10, uh, primarily gunfire. Because when you were firing guns, the engines would get would quit. And when the engines would quit, it would be qu very quiet. I mean, you didn't hear, it wasn't like a compressor stall where it makes a lot of noise. It would just, the, the temperatures would go up on the engines and you know, ruin them, or the, and the RPM would come down. So if I flew thousands and thousands of rounds at the ground to try to solve this engine problem. The problem with the A-10, with the engines, were twofold. One, with the gun gas going in the engines and causing the engine to quit. The other one was uh, pulling high angle attack or high turn rates, because the airplane had good handling quality, so nothing bad happened aerodynamically. But the engines couldn't stand the lack of the air. So the solution to both problems was to put continuous ignition on the trigger. So anytime you fired that, the continuous ignition came on to both engines. So if it quit, it restarted immediately. And also high angle attack, on angle attack. So ignition comes on uh, at high angle attack. The engines keep running. Well, they don't keep running, but the pilot doesn't know the difference. With the A-10 selected for production, the Air Force found itself in an unpleasant situation. Their motive for supporting the A-10 was always to kill the Army Cheyenne. In 1972, that became a reality. With the Cheyenne dead, they suddenly had a new close support plane in their hands, an aircraft they really didn't want for a mission they despised. 1972, the Cheyenne was safely dead. It had been killed. The Air Force had accomplished its mission and now started an unending series of assaults to kill the A-10. There wasn't a month that went by that some general didn't have some idea about how to kill the A-10. The Air Force felt the A-10 was primarily supporting the Army, and they really didn't want that mission. In fact, at one point in time, they were talking about to give the A-10s to the Army. But then the Air Force decided that was uh, their mission is to fly airplanes and not the Army's mission. So that got to be a controversy. So the Air Force said, OK, we'll support the Army. Okay. Air Force generals got together with an airplane manufacturer in Texas, Ling Tepco Vought, the old Chance Vought company that had been building A-7s for Vietnam. A pretty poor bombing airplane, highly vulnerable, full of flammable hydraulics and all that. And they claimed that they had a model that would do close support superbly. They got some congressmen to back them, along with these Air Force generals, and they actually forced us to do a fly-off of the A-7 against the then still in development A-10. So we dragged out the YA-10, the prototype, and had a little fly-off. The A-7 was so laughably worse that nobody could pretend that this was a good excuse for killing the A-10. The A-10 seemed to be equally resistant to battle damage as it was from assaults from the Air Force. Production continued and in March of 1976, the 355th Tactical Training Wing, based at davis Monthan Air Force Base, Arizona, became the first unit to receive the A-10 Thunderbolt II. This did not dissuade the Air Force from continuing to do all it could to whittle production numbers. Interestingly enough, the Reagan administration comes in and as I recall, the A-10, we had a procurement goal of 733 airplanes, something like that total. We had one more year to go. And the Reagan administration rolls in and of course flows money 
had everything the services wanted. And then Stockman, we call Mr. Stockman, who was OMB at the time, sort of said, my God, we need to take a look at all this money we're spending. You know, we're going in the whole tax cuts and all that. So he took aim on the defense budget. Stockman, the director of the Office of Management and Budget, battled with Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger over Reagan's bloated defense budget. A compromise was reached, which would leave A-10 production in the crosshairs. The library came back and said, hey, we got to show that we're stewards of the budget, so we need to cut some things. Lo and behold, what does the Air Force offer up? The last year of A-10 production, I think, it was a smaller number. We had been up to, I think, 144 aircraft a year. And they also tried to cancel the ammo procurement. Unbelievable. They didn't get away with that. It wasn't just the Air Force brass who had misgivings about the A-10. Pilots of the day would have preferred to be flying the latest supersonic fighters, but it didn't take long for them to come around. The guys who, who joined the A-10 community for one reason or another, a lot of them were there as punishment tours because it wasn't a glamorous tour for anybody. But they became committed to the airplane. The more they learned about the airplane, the mission, what it takes to help guys on the ground, how demanding the mission is, because it takes an enormous order of skill. I mean, it takes a whole set of skills air-to-air -air pilots don't even dream of. It's a totally different world. And they became dedicated to that world. And then, actually, you know, a bunch of wars came along where they could actually exercise those skills and refine them. And what's interesting is they had the same opposition from the Air Force in the wars as we had when we were trying to produce the airplane. The A-10's first combat mission was the invasion of Panama in 1989, when the U.S. ousted Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. Though the aircraft faced no real resistance, it would soon have an opportunity to prove itself fully. On August 2, 1990, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. There was international condemnation of the event, and the Iraqi dictator was given a hard deadline of January 15, 1991, to withdraw his army. Coalition forces built an impressive armada of weapons to push Hussein out of Kuwait, including 1,900 aircraft. Curiously, General Horner, commander of air operations, almost left the A-10 behind. General Horner was called in by General Schwarzkopf before the actual assault launch, and Schwarzkopf looks at the, at the list and he says, where's my A-10s? And General Horner says, oh, oh, we, we have, uh, uh, we, we have F-16s specially armed, they'll, they'll do the job. Schwarzkopf looks at him, says, I don't want to hear any of your Air Force political bullshit. Give me my A-10s. General Schwarzkopf recognized the abilities of the A-10 as a tank buster in close support plane. It had been built to destroy Soviet tanks, and the Iraqis had more than 5,000 of them. He made a wise choice. The A-10 destroyed more tactical targets than all other aircraft combined. Even General Horner could not deny the A-10's excellence, at least temporarily. The A-10s did such a good job of bailing out the failures of other airplanes that the same General Horner who had refused to deliver A-10s at the beginning of the war, said right in the middle of his staff in the famous uh, black hole bunker in Saudi Arabia that was commanding the whole air war, after he saw the results of the A-10s, particularly even in wiping out missile sites, mind you, which they'd never been intended to do, he said, I take back every bad thing I said about the A-10. They saved our asses. And that was heard by a whole bunch of staff members and has been widely quoted since then. Now, here's the interesting thing. After the war, when everything had died down, people had done the battle damage assessment, and by the way, the Air Force had totally suppressed the successes of the A-10 that I just quoted, uh, and had put out a whole bunch of junk about how brilliantly the F-117 did and all that, it was all hogwash. General Horner, uh, was forced by his fellow generals to renege on what he had said and join the assaults on the A-10. You know, actually, actually went back on what he had said about how they saved our asses. He said, no, they weren't that important. Now you ask yourself, 
how could a guy who had spent his career, you know, flying airplanes, he'd flown a lot of fighters, he wasn't just a bomber guy. But once he got to be a general, he was so infected by the culture around him of the other general officers. And that culture, dating again back to the 1920s, was a bomber culture. It's, you know, we go, we bomb targets that we assign to our Air Force. Uh, we do it independently of the Army. We do it with airplanes that are very expensive because they're good for getting us a bigger budget. And that's what the Air Force is about. Though the A-10 had done excellent work against Iraqi forces, by the end of the first Gulf War, the Air Force should have had a replacement in the pipeline. Aircraft have long gestation periods, and the A-10 was based on 1970s technology. But the bomber culture that permeated the upper echelons of the Air Force made a new aircraft nearly impossible. A lot of the people in the close support community, the military reform community, in, in 1983 started proposing developing a far better, far more modern A-10. You know, we called it variously the Mud Fighter or the Blitz Fighter. And it was going to be smaller, hotter, much better maneuverability, better, better able to get close in, better able to survive, have even more lethal weapons than the A-10. And we were ambitious to make it even cheaper than the A-10. And we had designs laid out, and we briefed them all over the Pentagon, and the Air Force came down like one man to kill it. The Air Force went bonkers. When they found out that Lockheed at Marietta, there were people down there doing some work on that. They told Lockheed, either you back off this and stop all this, or you don't have a press chance of competing with what was coming down the road, which was the advanced tactical fighter, which became the F-22. So they stopped. To put the final nail in this new aircraft's coffin, the Air Force offered a compromise of sorts. An Air Force two-star came down and said, okay, we, we want to sign a peace treaty. You guys back off pushing this new aircraft, okay? You do that, and we promise we will back off retiring A-10s. Not only that, we will upgrade them. So we agreed. So they did. They took away the planned retirement. So, which was to start probably in 1990-91. Without a replacement, close support pilots were forced to soldier on with aging A-10s. Now, the Air Force had a new excuse to rid themselves of the A-10. It was too old. Nothing changes about these assaults. The first one is always, ah, the airplane is so old, you know. It's aging, it's decrepit, it's going to cost a lot to maintain. It's a perfectly silly argument. First of all, the A-10 is not the only old airplane in the Air Force. The Air Force generals are defending a far older airplane, the B-52. It's okay, we've so refurbished and remodernized it, even if it is older than all the pilots, who cares? Well, oddly enough, the same thing is true of the A-10. The A-10 has been heavily refurbished. In fact, it's an amazingly modern airplane now. First of all, most of the fleet has been re-winged, although the Air Force is now trying to steal that money for the F-35, the re-winging money. But most of them have already been re-winged and will be good to 2040. You know, secondly, it's completely false that older airplanes get more expensive to maintain. The older airplanes, B-52 included, are vastly cheaper to maintain than any of the new airplanes that, that replace them. And they're just like old cars. If you find somebody to make the parts, you can keep a car going forever, and people who love the car do. As the airplane stands today, there's nothing and nothing that can touch it in terms of performing this mission. There's just no way. It can do all the things that the ultra high tech systems and like F-15s and F-18s and so on can do all those things just as well as they can, but it can work the other end of the spectrum down low. In lack of anything else, I would open the line and build more A-10s. From the invasion of Iraq to Afghanistan to the war against ISIS, 
the Air Force has been equally reluctant to bring the raging warrior to battle with them. Though the A-10s took part in the initial assault on Iraq, they were mothballed from 2003 to 2007. The USAF tried to rely on F-16s and other fighters to hit targets on the ground, but they were often inaccurate and caused casualties amongst friendlies. It wasn't until 2007 that the Air Force was forced to concede they still needed the A-10, an aircraft originally designed for a jungle war. The A-10 was a uh, Vietnam follow-on because all the airplanes in Vietnam didn't have much fuel to stay around the target area. And of course, Vietnam was over, but it turns out now that the A-10 was perfect for Iraq and Afghanistan because it can loiter for long times, it's got plenty of ammo. Uh, that gun is absolutely outstanding as far as uh, the 30 millimeter. You put the pipper on the target and the first dozen bullets go there. You know, no question, that's where they go. Like the USAF, the Russian Air Force has a dedicated ground support aircraft of their own, the Sukhoi Su-25. An aircraft with an uncanny resemblance to Northrop's A-9. Introduced in 1981, it is still in production, and with multiple upgrades it continues to support Russian troops and the troops of buyers from around the world. The Russian Air Force does not seem to have the same hang-ups about close support as the USAF, and in 2015, the Su-25 was brought into Syria to combat ISIS. Rather than create a new dedicated close support aircraft, the USAF is pinning their hopes and dollars on stealth, multi-role fighter, the F-35. This versatile aircraft was designed to handle the missions of not only the A-10, but also the F-16 and F-18, and AV-8 for the USAF, Navy, and Marines. Critics of the A-10 label it a single-purpose aircraft, but could a jack-of-all-trades master any of these missions? Here we are now with the A-10 obviously now 40 years old, 30 to 40 years old, uh, though it's still got life. Uh, and we have one program going, F-35, and that's gonna fill all these missions. And that, that's just outrageous to even, you know, think about that. Multitasking is a huge waste of money because it leads to enormously expensive airplanes. Instead of that quarter billion dollar airplane, we could have a great close support airplane for $20 million or $25 million. We could have a great fighter, air-to-air -air fighter, for $30 or $35 million. And then we could have whatever else you need, a reconnaissance airplane or some of those other kind of missions that maybe it does. We could have one of those for $30 or $35 million. It's uncertain when the F-35 will be able to take over for the A-10 and how effective it will be. Though the A-10s have been upgraded into the most advanced close support aircraft in the world, the USAF is almost embarrassed to bring them to front lines as they battle ISIS and prepare for a potential conflict in the Ukraine. I agree with the Air Force, you know. It is a disgrace that we're flying that ancient airplane, and it's their fault. Because we should have been started, by the mid-80s, we should have been started prototyping something that was better than the A-10 and then let it prove that it was better. If it wasn't better, then we wouldn't build it. So we never did that because the Air Force never wanted to do that mission. Over the years, the A-10 has proven itself the premier close support aircraft in the world. Sadly, it has also become a symbol of the strife between the branches of the armed services. The A-10 was authorized by the Air Force as a means to destroy an Army helicopter. Though it ended up doing an exceptional job supporting the Army, from day one it has been under attack from within. The A-10 still has its detractors, but the resilient aircraft is ready to prove itself if given the chance. As each branch fights for its share of the defense budget, perhaps they are blinded to the bigger picture, that they are at war with their enemies, not each other. The F-35 Lightning II is one of America's most iconic fighter aircraft. 
only a close second to the feared F-22 Raptor. Its visionary innovations have been both bane and blessing. The plane's design has received admiration and appreciation globally. It stood as a reminder that American engineering and ingenuity could achieve the seemingly impossible while ushering in the new age of military aeronautics. The F-35's story begins with the Joint Strike Fighter program, which aimed to create a new generation of Stovall aircraft that could replace the landmark F-16. The nation's industry titans competed for access to the resulting contract. McDonnell Douglas, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin worked tirelessly to present their most innovative designs as offerings. However, Lockheed's revolutionary reheated turbofan augmented thrust engine with its futuristic lift system would win the coveted opportunity. While Boeing's design certainly came with less challenges than Lockheed's, the Department of Defense determined that Lockheed's pioneering lift fan system's superior performance far outweighed its risks. And so, the historic company would join the US government on a journey to permanently change the standards and capabilities of the modern jet fighter. The backbone of the F-35 program would be its unprecedented Pratt & Whitney F-135 engine. The company would join teams with Rolls-Royce and Hamilton Sundstrand to create a revolutionary propulsion system that allowed for shatteringly short takeoff times. Rolls-Royce would develop the lift system, which was conceived using seminal new technology. Unlike the Yak-38, which used separate lift engines or the rotating nozzles of the Harrier, the new engine used a highly flexible thrust vectoring nozzle that could provide the needed lift. The F-135's nozzle was also capable of withstanding afterburn temperatures. The nozzle would direct thrust in any direction the pilot needed to carry out a wide range of landing and takeoff capabilities while maintaining significant stealth. In order to achieve vertical flight, the propulsion system equipped a whopping 29,000 horsepower. To this day, the technology, ingenuity, and genius that went into designing the F-135 is considered one of, if not the greatest feat in the aeronautical history of America, for which it won the esteemed Collier Trophy. It was billed as a fighter jet that could do almost everything the U.S. military desired, serving the Air Force, Marine Corps, and Navy, and even Britain's Royal Air Force and Royal Navy, all in one aircraft design. It's supposed to replace and improve upon several current and aging aircraft types, with widely different missions. It's marketed as a cost-effective, powerful multi-role fighter airplane significantly better than anything potential adversaries could build in the next two decades. Lockheed Martin said the plane would be far better than current aircraft, quote, four times more effective in air-to-air -air combat and eight times more effective in air-to-ground combat. Not only that, but also three times more effective in recognizing and suppressing an enemy's air defenses. It would, in fact, be second only to the F-22 in air superiority. In addition, the F-35 was to have better range and require less logistics support than current military aircraft. 
the Pentagon is still calling the F-35, quote, the most affordable, lethal, supportable, and survivable aircraft ever to be used. Like the F-117 and F-22, the F-35's stealth capability greatly reduces but does not eliminate its radar cross-section. The signal that radar receivers see bouncing back off an airplane. The plane looks smaller on radar, perhaps like a bird rather than a plane, but is not invisible. The F-35 is designed to be stealthy primarily in the X-band, the radar frequency range most commonly used for targeting in air-to-air -air combat. Of course, radar is not the only way to locate and target an aircraft. One can also use an aircraft's infrared emissions, which are created by friction-generated heat as it flies through the air along with its hot engines. Several nations, particularly the Russians, have excellent passive infrared search and tracking systems that can locate and target enemy aircraft with great precision, sometimes using lasers to measure exact distances, but without needing radar. It is also very common in air-to-air -air battles for opposing planes to come close enough that their pilots can see each other. Lockheed Martin and the Pentagon say the F-35's superiority over its rivals lies in its ability to remain undetected, giving it, quote, first look, first shot, first kill. The F-35 program is the result of the merging or combination of several other separate and diverse projects into a set of requirements for an airplane that is trying to be everything to everybody. In combat, the difference between winning and losing is often not very great, with second place all too often meaning death. The Pentagon seeks to provide warriors with the best possible equipment. The best tools are those that are tailor-made, to address specific missions and types of combat. For a fighter airplane, funding decisions become a balancing act of procuring not just the best aircraft possible, but enough of them to make an effective force. This has led to the creation of so-called multi-role fighter aircraft, capable both in air-to-air -air combat and against ground targets. Where trade-offs have to happen, designers of most multi-role fighters emphasize aerial combat strength reducing air-to-ground capabilities. The F-35 is an excellent piece of equipment, despite its shortcomings. Fourth-generation fighters hailing from three nations, including F-16 Fighting Falcons, F-15 Eagles, and Eurofighter Typhoons, coordinated with E-8 Joint Stars Command. As their stealthy escorts, both F-22 Raptors and F-35 Joint Strike Fighters surveyed the battle space. Soon, cockpit displays in each aircraft began to light up and alarms sounded, indicating that the formation was being painted by multiple radar arrays tied to surface-to-air missiles and inbound fighters. Enemy fighters sporting the color schemes of Russian Su-30s began to close in. Travolis Simmons, commander of the 57th Adversary Tactics Group, noted that on the last week of a red flag exercise, we really throw everything we have at the Blue Force and replicate the toughest adversary possible. Ultimately, the F-35 fighter jet won the day, breaking down one of the world's most advanced air defense networks and relaying the GATA to missile-packed fighters like the F-16. The F-35 can fly at speeds as high as Mach 1.6, and can carry an internal payload of four weapons without compromising its stealth. But it's not the F-35's firepower that really makes the difference. It's the computing power. It's why F-35s have come to be known as quarterbacks in the sky, or a computer that happens to fly. Major Justin Hazardly, an Air Force F-35 pilot instructor, noted that, quote, there has never been an aircraft that provides as much situational awareness as the F-35. In combat situational awareness, the F-35 is worth its weight in gold. The aircraft we know today as the F-35 was built to meet the demands of multiple fighting forces with a single, highly capable aircraft. This new joint strike fighter, Pentagon officials believed, would allow for streamlined logistical supply lines, maintenance and training. It would also leverage the same stealth technologies 
found in the F-22. With a laundry list of requirements from the US Navy, Air Force, DARPA, and soon the UK and Canada, the Joint Strike Fighter program quickly moved from its official proposal in 1995 to two competitive prototypes in 1997. Lockheed Martin's X-35 and Boeing's X-32. And the new fighter had its work cut out for it. The Joint Strike Fighter needed to replace at least five different aircraft across all the different services, including the high-speed interceptor F-14 Tomcat and the tank-killing close air support A-10 Thunderbolt II. Designed from the ground up to prioritize low observability, the F-35 may be the stealthiest fighter in operation to date. It uses a single F-135 engine that produces 40,000 pounds of thrust, with the afterburner engaged, capable of pushing the sleek but husky fighter to speeds as high as Mach 1.6. The aircraft can carry four weapons internally while flying in contested airspace, or can be outfitted with six additional weapons mounted on external hardpoints when flying in low-risk environments. The F-35A also comes equipped with an internal four-barrel, 25mm rotary cannon, hidden behind a small door to minimize radar returns, allowing the F-35 to engage both airborne and ground-based targets. Lockheed Martin has developed a new internal weapons carriage that will eventually allow it to carry an additional two missiles internally. The cockpit of the F-35 foregoes the litany of gauges and screens found in previous generations of fighter, in favor of large touch screens and a helmet-mounted display system that allows the pilot to see real-time information. This helmet also allows the pilot to look directly through the aircraft, thanks to the F-35's distributed aperture system, also known as DAS, and a suite of six infrared cameras mounted strategically around the aircraft. In an interview with the New York Times, Tom Burbage, Lockheed's general manager of the program from 2000 to 2013, said that, quote, If you were to go back to the year 2000, and somebody said, I can build an airplane that is stealthy and has vertical takeoff and landing capabilities, and can go supersonic, most people in the industry would have said, that's impossible. The technology to bring all of that together into a single platform was beyond the reach of industry at that time. While both the X-32 and X-35 prototypes performed well, the deciding factor in the competition may have been the F-35's complicated short takeoff and vertical landing flight. Because the US Marine Corps intended to use this new plane as a replacement for the AV-8B Harrier jump jets, America's new stealth fighter had to be able to fill the same vertical landing short takeoff role. The lift fan design used in the X-35 connected the engine at the back of the aircraft to a drive shaft that would power a large fan installed in the aircraft's fuselage behind the pilot. When hovering, the F-35 would orient its engine downward, not unlike the X-32, but it would also pull air from above the aircraft and force it down through the fan and out the bottom, creating two balanced sources of thrust that made the aircraft far more stable. It also helped the F-35 notch a win in the looks category. Rick Resbeck, an engineer at Lockheed, said, quote, You can look at the Lockheed Martin airplane and say, that looks like what I would expect a modern, high-performance, high-capable jet fighter to look like. You look at the Boeing airplane, and the general reaction is, I don't get it. Ultimately, Lockheed Martin won out over Boeing's unusual-looking X-32 prototype in October of 2001. The future looks bright for the newly named F-35. While Lockheed's lift fan approach to Stovall flight might have nabbed the contract, the hard part was just beginning. Choosing to begin with the least complex iteration of the new fighter, Lockheed's Skunk Works started designing the F-35A intended for use in the U.S. Air Force as a traditional runway fighter, like the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Once the F-35A was complete, the engineering team would then move on to more complex Stovall F-35B for use by the U.S. Marine Corps. And then finally, the F-35C, 
meant for carrier duty. There was just one problem, jamming all the necessary hardware for the different variants into a single fuselage proved extremely difficult. By the time Lockheed Martin wrapped up design work on the F-35A and got to work on the B, they realized the weight estimates they had established while designing the Air Force variant would lead to an aircraft that was 3,000 pounds too heavy. This miscalculation created a significant setback. To truly understand the F-35, you have to understand its variants and their differing capabilities. The F-35A is intended for use by the US Air Force and many allied nations. The F-35A is the conventional takeoff and landing CTOL variant. This aircraft is intended to operate out of traditional airstrips and is the only version of the F-35 to come equipped with a 25mm internal cannon, allowing it to step in for both the F-16 multi-role fighter and the flying cannon A-10 Thunderbolt II, among many others. The F-35B was purpose-built for short takeoff and vertical landing operations, or Stovall, and was designed with the needs of the US Marine Corps in mind. While still able to operate off of traditional runways, the Stovall capability offered by the F-35B allows Marines to operate these jets from austere runways, or off the decks of amphibious assault ships, often referred to as lightning carriers. And finally, the F-35C is the first stealth fighter ever designed for carrier operations with the US Navy. It boasts larger wings than its peers, to allow for slower approach speeds when landing on a carrier. More robust landing gear aids in tough carrier landings, and it harbors a larger fuel supply, roughly 20,000 pounds worth, internally, to support longer range missions. The C is also the only F-35 equipped with the folding wings, allowing for easier storage in the hull of ships. Lockheed Martin's team would eventually work out the finer points of each different platform. So what really separates the pricey F-35 from the fighter jets that have come before? Two words, data management. Today's pilots have to manage a huge amount of information while flying, and doing so means splitting your time between traveling the speed of sound and a collage of screens, gauges, and sensor readouts screaming for your attention. Unlike previous fighter jets, the F-35 uses a combination of heads-up display and helmet-based augmented reality to keep vital information directly in the pilot's field of view. Some of the plane's helmet's features include every generation 3 being customized to its owner's head to prevent slippage during flight and to ensure that the displays appear in correct locations. To do this, technicians scan each pilot's head, mapping every feature and translating it into the helmet's inner lining. Pilots used to have to switch over to a mounted night vision attachment when flying in the dark. The Generation 3 helmet projects a night vision reading of the surrounding environment directly onto the visor when the pilot switches the system on. The shell is made of carbon fiber, which is what gives it its characteristic checkered pattern. A tight coil of bound cables comes out of the back of the helmet to connect it to the plane. When the wearer turns his head in a specific direction, the wires feed the helmet the proper camera footage. The communication system has active noise cancellation. Speakers produce a sound that opposes wind noise and the low-frequency hum of the jet engines so pilots can hear clearly. The F-35 fuses everything into a green dot if you are looking at a good guy, and a red dot if it's a bad guy. It's very pilot-friendly. All the information is shown on a panoramic cockpit display that is essentially two giant iPads. It's not just how the information reaches the pilot, but also how it's collected. The F-35 is capable of gathering information from a wide variety of sensors located on the aircraft and from information sourced from ground vehicles, drones, other aircraft, and nearby ships. It collects all of that information, as well as network-driven data about targets and nearby threats, 
and spits it all out into a single interface the pilot can easily manage while flying. With a god's eye view of the area, F-35 pilots can coordinate efforts with fourth generation aircraft, making them deadlier in the process. The F-35 is the quarterback of the battlefield. Its job is to make everyone around it better. Fourth generation fighters like the F-16 and F-15 will be relevant until at least the late 2040s. Because there are so many more of them than the F-35, the job of F-35 pilots is to use their unique assets to shape the battlefield and make it more survivable for other planes. All of that information may sound daunting, but for fighter pilots who've experienced the daunting task of compiling information from a dozen different screens and gauges, the F-35's user interface is nothing short of miraculous. Tony Wilson who served in the U.S. Navy for 25 years prior to joining Lockheed Martin as a test pilot, has flown over 20 different aircraft, from helicopters to the U-2 spy plane and even a Russian MiG-15. According to him, the F-35 is by far the easiest aircraft to fly that he's come across. He notes that as we move into fourth-generation fighters like the F-16, we moved from being pilots to being sensor managers. Now, with the F-35, Sensor Fusion allows us to take some of that sensor management responsibility off the pilot's hands, allowing them to be true tacticians. In May of 2018, the Israeli Defense Force became the first nation to send F-35s into combat, conducting two airstrikes with the F-35As in the Middle East. By September of the same year, the U.S. Marine Corps sent their first F-35Bs into the fight, engaging ground targets in Afghanistan, followed by the U.S. Air Force using their F-35As for airstrikes in Iraq in April 2019. Today, over 500 F-35 Lightning IIs have been delivered to nine nations and are operating out of 23 air bases around the world. That's more than Russia's fleet of 5th generation Su-57s and China's fleet of J-20s combined. With literally thousands more on order, the F-35 promises to be the backbone of US air power. And unlike previous fighter generations, the F-35's capabilities are expected to keep up with the times. Thanks to software architecture, designed to allow the F-35 to receive frequent updates. The aircraft's form has stayed the same, but its function has already changed radically. The airplane that took flight in 2006 may have looked identical on the outside, but it was a very different aircraft than the one flying today. And the F-35 flying 10 years from now is going to be very different from the one flying today. The F-35 will also serve as a test bed for technologies that will become commonplace in the next generation of jets. Flying in coordination with AI-enabled drones will become a staple of any sixth generation fighter, and those new fighter tricks will likely first arrive in the form of the F-35. According to many pilots and experts, it may well be the most capable, most connected, most survivable aircraft on the face of the planet, and what we're able to achieve with it today shows that we can't even imagine what tomorrow's F-35 is going to be capable of. So was the F-35 an obliterating headache or a good omen? Only time will tell if the US government's investment was worthwhile. So far, it seems to be paying off.
The F-22 Raptor is the most advanced of its breed, built around the first look, first shot, first kill ethos. The Raptor is a killing machine, just like the name implies. It's even more deadly when it gets out there and does the job. Deadly and undetectable at long range, this breathtaking fifth-generation fighter blends unmatched dogfighting with precision strike ground attack capabilities. Confidence lies in the fact these goals are achievable as a result of synergistic combination of characteristics and capabilities, including low observables, also known as stealth, the ability to cruise at supersonic speeds, or supercruise, over long range and without the use of afterburners, and an integrated and highly sophisticated avionics unit. Additionally, the FA-22A has been designed to be more maneuverable, better armed, more reliable, more easily maintained, more readily supportable, and more capable in the air-to-ground mission than any other comparable aircraft in history. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the Soviets developed different missiles to attack in different altitude bands. You couldn't fly under the missile threat, you couldn't fly over the missile threat, you had to deal with the missile threat. One way to do that is to make suppression of enemy air defense, that is, destroying the missile sites in the radars, the most important mission for the Air Force. By the 1970s, air superiority had re-emerged as a top priority and the U.S. Air Force committed to building its first pure air superiority fighter, an aircraft that would eventually become the F-15 Eagle. But just as the F-15s became operational in 1978, alarming new evidence suggested that the new fighter's superiority might only be temporary. Reconnaissance satellites had photographed several new fighter prototypes, the Mikoyan MiG-29, and Sukhoi T-10 at the Raminskoy Flight Test Center outside of a small city of Zhukovsky, about 40 miles southeast of Moscow. This new generation of Russian fighters represented a significant improvement in capability over anything previously observed by U.S. intelligence services. It was obvious to all concerned that a new air-to-air -air combat platform would be required to counter the new threat these new Russian aircrafts represented. The Sukhoi T-10 came as a huge shock to Western analysts. It was bigger than the F-15, and far bigger than any previous Soviet-built fighter. If the MiG-29 had concerned the American military establishment, the existence of the Sukhoi T-10 set alarm bells ringing. These are very good aircraft, aircraft that can play in the same league as some of the top NATO fighters like Phantom and ultimately like F-15. Just weeks into his first term, America's 40th president increased U.S. defense spending by $32.5 billion and began the rearmament of the United States on a colossal scale. The goal is world peace. It is absolutely essential that we increase our spending for national defense if we're to preserve the peace. As Reagan and Brezhnev squared up, the U.S. Air Force concluded that it would urgently need a new replacement for its F-15, an advanced tactical fighter, or ATF, that would have no equal. As American planners start to develop the concept of air-land battle to fight World War III, the U.S. Air Force starts to think about the kind of equipment it wants to have when it comes to fighting the war. Two sub-projects were established under this banner, the Advanced Tactical Fighter, which included concept and technology development, seven airframe companies, being Boeing, General Dynamics, Grumman, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, Northrop, and Rockwell. Each received concept development investigation contracts for $1 million. And the Joint Fighter Engine, which was an engine technology demonstration program to be managed jointly with the U.S. Navy, Pratt & Whitney, and General Electric, each received contracts valued at $202 million during September of 1983. The seven competing companies submitted some 19 conceptual designs. From these, it was concluded that the ideal air-to-air -air platform would offer low observables in combination with supercruise and superior maneuverability. Analysis of air-to-air -air combat in Vietnam, called the Red Baron Study, had kickstarted the race for stealth. The principle of stealth technology is to literally make an LL plane invisible to the enemy. 
An aircraft shape must reflect incoming radio waves away from the enemy radar, rather than towards it. To further increase low observable characteristics, an airplane is then covered in materials that absorb radar signals, further reducing its visibility on radar screens. Leading the way in stealth technology was Lockheed Skunk Works Division. In 1977, amid unprecedented security, Lockheed had flown a prototype of the world's first stealth fighter, The U.S. Air Force decided that any new fighter must incorporate stealth technology and identified two other areas in which a future air superiority fighter should excel. The challenge had been issued. Now, it was up to the finest aviation manufacturers in the world to respond. The Advanced Tactical Fighter Program was about to begin, and the Raptor, America's fifth-generation fighter, was about to be hatched. By 1983, U.S.-Soviet relations had reached a new low. Following Leonid Brezhnev's death, the Politburo, now controlled by ex-KGB boss Yuri Andropov, had been labeled by Reagan as the focus of evil in the modern world. That August, when Korean airline flight 007 on its way to Seoul from New York strayed several hundred miles off course into Soviet airspace, Russia acted. A fighter was sent up, and the civilian airliner with 269 people on board was shot down. A shooting down of KAL-007 sent shockwaves around the world, straining international relations almost at a breaking point. Reagan's reaction to the crisis strengthened U.S. conviction that stealth would now be the prime requirement for America's new fighter. Following some four initial drafts, the basic framework for the ATF requirement, calling for a radius of action of approximately 800 miles, supersonic cruise capability of 1.4 to 1.5 Mach, a 2,000 feet runway requirement, a gross takeoff weight of 50,000 pounds, and a unit cost of no more than 40 million in 1985 dollars was released to industry. Importantly, implied in the proposal was a requirement that the ATF life cycle cost be at least as good as, if not better than, the McDonnell Douglas F-15. It was concluded that Lockheed and Northrop's submissions were superior to those of Boeing, General Dynamics, and McDonnell Douglas. Lockheed had conducted consortium discussions with Boeing and General Dynamics as early as June of 1986, but did not formalize an agreement with its partners until the following October 13. Consequently, Lockheed assigned Sherman Mullen as general manager for the ATF team program office. Mullen, would direct Lockheed in the prime contractor role and consequently take advantage of the unique technical strengths represented by Boeing and General Dynamics. Northrop, some two weeks later, followed suit by serving as lead on team with McDonnell Douglas. Thus, by default, the two consortia were selected on October 31, 1986, to build two prototypes, each to complete in revised demonstration and validation phase. Lockheed, under a $691 million contract, would build two of what later would become its Model 1132 aircraft under the official Air Force designation YF-22. Northrop, under a similar $691 million contract, would build two of its N-14 prototypes under the official Air Force designation YF-23. And in 1990, just months after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the shapes of the two rival designs were finally unveiled. Northrop's version, called the YF-23, closely resembled its original design. In contrast, Lockheed's design, called the YF-22, seemed surprisingly conventional. With four tail surfaces, vectored thrust, a broad solid body, and a conventional wing. But unlike Lockheed's other stealth aircraft, the F-117, radar-absorbent materials were not applied over the whole of the F-A-22, but used selectively on its edges, cavities, and crucial surface areas. The F-22 carries its weapons internally. Four weapon bays are hidden in the central mid-body section. Six missiles can be carried in the ventral bays, which are covered by bifold doors. The side bays will each hold one Sidewinder missile, carried on a trapeze launcher, the mid-body section also houses the fighter's landing gear and complex inlet ducts. Attached to the mid-body is the forebody, 
which accommodates the cockpit and advanced avionics. Both the YF-23 and the YF-22 are impressive-looking machines, but their performance still needs to be tested. The most crucial stage of the competition is still to come, the flight testing. Northrop was first in the air. In August 1990, flown by Paul Metz, the YF-23 got airborne. The test was a huge success. But Lockheed was quick to respond, and, on September the 29th, at Edwards Air Force Base in California, Lockheed's chief test pilot Dave Ferguson prepared the Raptor for its maiden flight. Over the next three months, the Raptor underwent a whole series of tests. The Air Force required both teams to give them performance projections, and they were actually going to compare that with what the planes actually did in flight subsonic and supersonic at different altitudes and so forth. The winner of this stage would earn a contract for 650 aircraft. The decision would hinge not just on what the contractors promised, but on the Air Force's confidence in their ability to deliver. During flight testing, the Raptor had beaten Northrop's YF-23 in a number of crucial performance areas. The YF-22 had clearly shown that in every category, it was far superior to any existing fighter. The Air Force was very, very impressed by what Lockheed had done, but their flight test program was very aggressive. They flew hard and fast. They flew many more hours and sorties than Northrop did, and all of that gave the Air Force confidence that they knew what they were doing, and they could build a superior plane. But it would be events in 1991 that would carve out the Raptors' future. 22 minutes after midnight on January the 17th, 1991, Lockheed's stealth F-117 spearheaded U.S. strikes against Saddam Hussein's regime. The performance of Lockheed's stealth bombers during Operation Desert Storm would give the company and its aircraft some priceless publicity. The F-15, the aircraft destined to be replaced by the ATF, had emphatically confirmed its status as the foremost air superiority fighter in the world. Now, it appeared that the need for an advanced stealth fighter, the F-22, might be totally unfounded. But not everyone agrees. By April 1991, bogged down by the F-15 debate, the U.S. Air Force prepares to announce the winner of the advanced tactical fighter contract. But would the Raptor be able to emerge from the controversy unscathed? After the Dem Val flight test of the prototypes, Secretary of the USAF Donald Rice announced the Lockheed team and Pratt & Whitney as the winners of the ATF and engine competitions. The YF-23 design was considered stealthier and faster, while the YF-22, with its thrust vectoring nozzles, was more maneuverable as well as less expensive and risky. Having won the contract, Lockheed announced that it intended to locate the F-22's headquarters in Georgia, where the Raptor's forward fuselage would be built. General Dynamics were to build the F-22's mid-body section in Fort Worth, Texas, and Boeing would manufacture the wings and tail in Seattle, Washington. Follow-on work using this aircraft took place at the Edwards Air Force Base. It was to consist of an additional 100 hours of flying time, or approximately 25 flights to expand the YF-22A's flight envelope and explore select envelope segments in greater detail. But, on April 25, 1992, the program hit its first major snag. During preliminary testing, the unthinkable happened. A YF-22 flown by Tom Morganfield crashed just after takeoff. The aircraft hit the runway with the landing gear up and slid approximately 8,000 feet and caught fire. Despite the loss of the stealth aircraft, the program had achieved its major goals. 10 million man-hours of analysis 4,000 hours of radar testing and hundreds of hours of flight testing had gone into the development of the aircraft, even before construction was given the go. In fact, the F-22 has accomplished more flight testing than any other fighter prior to full-scale production. On April 9th, the first F-22A, officially named Raptor, an earlier attempt to make the name of the aircraft Superstar failed in 1991, 
was rolled out in a public ceremony at Lockheed Martin's Marietta, Georgia facility for the first time. Now, Air Force pilots would get the opportunity to check up on the new aircraft for themselves. First flown by the Air Force in 1997, pilots at Edwards Air Force Base have surpassed 2,000 flight test hours in more than 900 missions. One of the key advances in the Raptor's design is its advanced cockpit and integrated avionics system. Key mission systems include Sanders General Electric Electronic Warfare System, Martin Marietta Infrared and Ultraviolet Missile Launch Detector, Westinghouse Texas Instruments Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar, TRW Communication Navigation Identification Suite, and Long Range Advanced IRST. The radio frequency receivers of the Electronic Support Measures System give the aircraft the ability to perform intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance tasks. The F-22 has a glass cockpit with all digital flight instruments. The monochrome head-up display offers a wide field of view and serves as a primary flight instrument. Information is also displayed upon six color liquid crystal display, or LCD panels. This airplane displays information to you, it gives you knowledge of the battle space, it's all about seeing what's out there in front of you, and being able to make the right decisions about what to engage and when to engage it. The ejection seat is a version of the ACES-2, commonly used in USAF aircraft, with a center-mounted ejection control. The Raptor carries a formidable array of ordnance. The F-22 has three internal weapon bays, a large main bay on the bottom of the fuselage, and two smaller bays on the sides of the fuselage aft of the engine inlets. The main bay is split along the center line and can accommodate six launchers for beyond visual range missiles and each side bay has a launcher for short range missiles. The primary air-to-air -air missiles are the AIM-120 AMRAM and the AIM-9 Sidewinder with planned integration of the AIM-260 JATN. Missile launches require the bay doors to be open for less than a second, during which pneumatic or hydraulic arms push missiles clear of the aircraft. This is to reduce vulnerability to detection and to deploy missiles during high-speed flight. While the F-22 typically carries weapons internally, the wings include four hardpoints, each rated to handle 5,000 pounds or 2,300 kilos. Each hardpoint can accommodate a pylon that can carry a detachable 600-gallon or 2,270-liter external fuel tank for a launcher holding two air-to-air -air missiles. And to complement the Raptor's armament of eight missiles, the fighter also has a gun. An internally mounted M61A2 Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon is embedded in the airplane's right wing route, with the muzzle covered by a retractable door. The radar projection of the cannon's fire path is displayed on the pilot's head up display. But since Desert Storm, critics of the F 22 program claim that the F 15 Eagle, destined to be replaced by the Raptor, already had the attributes necessary to remain the world's preeminent air superiority fighter. In March 2003, supporters of the F-15 got the opportunity to see whether or not the Eagle was still the best fighter in the sky. Five F-15s would go head-to-head -head with a single Raptor. Although no missiles would be used during the exercise, the sorties would closely resemble actual combat. No quarter would be given by either side. This was a kill or be killed exercise. All five F-15s are flown by experienced F-22 pilots. One by one, the Raptor brings them down. In combat testing with F-15s, the F-22 Raptor has emphatically proven its doubters wrong. In December 2005, the U.S. Air Force announced that the F-22 had achieved initial operational capability. During exercise Northern Edge in Alaska in June 2006, in simulated combat exercises, 12 F-22s downed 108 adversaries with no losses. In the exercises, the F-22 amassed 241 kills against two losses in air-to-air -air combat, with neither loss being an F-22. The F-22 cannot be exported under U.S. federal law to protect its stealth technology and classified features. Customers for U.S. fighters are acquiring earlier designs such as the F-15 Eagle and F-16 Fighting Falcon, or the newer F-35 Lightning II, which contains technology from the F-22, but was designed to be cheaper, more flexible, and available for export. 
The USAF had originally planned to buy a total of 750 ATFs. In 2009, the program was cut to 187 operational aircraft due to high costs. A lack of air-to-air -air missions due to the focus on counterinsurgency operations at the time of production, a ban on exports, and development of the more affordable and versatile F-35, with the last F-22 delivered in 2012. America's F-22 Raptor was created out of the Cold War fear that the Russian-made fighters would sweep aside the F-15s. The United States Air Force is the only operator of the F-22. As of August 2022, it has 183 aircraft in its inventory. In today's changing world, there are few certainties. But the rule of the Raptor, America's air dominance fighter of the skies, is one of them. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunder Chief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras, and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation, and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage, and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescape's YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.